hit the record. Do you guys see a record on your screen? Because I've, I've got so many windows open. Excellent. Okay, cool. So Abby, feel free. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Abby Billings. I'm one of the assistant deans here in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. So I'm just going to be um, kind of moderating this, letting you in, reading some questions. Um, but I'm really going to turn it over to Robin and our students um, from the School of Architecture who are going to take it from here. So Robin, feel free awesome. to- Awesome. Thank you so much, Abby. Uh, we're getting pretty good at this. Welcome everybody. We are so glad to have you today and for you to share your time with us. Um, I wanted to just uh, quickly lay out what's gonna be um, in store for you over the next hour. We're gonna do some quick introductions um, and then we're gonna give you an overview of what studying architecture at Catholic University is like. Okay, each one of these presentations that we do is unique, so feel free and come back. We have another one in two weeks, and I'll give you some more information at the end about that. But first, I'd like to kick off with some introductions. So first of all, my name is Robin Puddick. I'm the uh, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies in the School of Architecture and Planning at the Catholic University of America. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I am a practicing architect with over 20 years of experience. I specialize in sustainable civic architecture. So schools, libraries, community centers, um, all of my buildings are high performing, net zero, um, and I very much care about the people and the planet. So I specialize in well-being. Um, I'm very passionate about that. The overlap between the building's effect on human beings is a new, relatively new field called neuroarchitecture. So that's one of my passions. I've been teaching at Catholic University for four years now. I've taught every level of studio and a lot of other seminar courses. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'd like to um, introduce one by one all of the people with the red backgrounds here that you see. Um, so Tanya, would you kick us off? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies in the School of Architecture, um, happily working alongside of Robin. And uh, I have run the EIA program uh, for some years now. So I know some of you um, and all of the persons with the red background are related to that. Um, I have been practicing architecture for a long time as well. I went more in the competition and um, competition side. So I saw more projects from uh, that made, made their public face, but um, have a different trajectory. After doing that for a while, I got really interested in public interest architecture and have now been working on that side. So thinking about how we can make architecture accessible to many and all people. So that's my, my passion. But I also teach freshman courses and experiences in architecture, which is the, what we're going to talk a little bit about today. And um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Tanya. And then next up, we have a, a, a wide array of students. So basically, our goal is at the end of this session, when you guys have questions, hopefully we have the answers. So first up for the students, we have Angus. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Angus, second year IPAL student who attended the EIA program in the summer of 2018. Um, Robin, do you want me to present right now or just? No, no, not yet. We, we're okay. going to make them wait a little bit. We're just going to do introductions. So I think that's wonderful, Angus. Thanks so much. Uh, Jack. Hi, my name is Jack Holcomb. I'm a third year architecture student here at CUS, and I was in the EIA uh, program in 2017. And, Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't mean to cut you off. No, um, sorry. Next up, we have Nikolai. Uh, hi, I'm, my name is Nikolai Dedinsky. I'm also a third year architecture student in the IPAL program. Um, and I was also a part of the EIA class of 2017 with Jack. Awesome, thank you. Next up, Rebecca. Hi everyone, so my name is Rebecca Ongoy. Um, I'm a grad student, second year, and I was an instructor for EIA of 2020. Thanks Rebecca, and last but not least, Miss Allison. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Davin. I'm a first year Master of Architecture student. I also got my undergrad at Catholic University in Architecture and I minored in Sustainability. Thank you, excited hey. to be here. Awesome, Allison, thanks so much. So an overview of our session today, this is the second session in a series of information sessions. Like I said, each one is unique. They're all recorded, uh, so we will post them on the website. 
Um, and I will post that link in the chat so you can just grab it and maybe bookmark it and make sure to, to check back with us and see the first one if you didn't attend. Um, take a look at that. Um, also tell your friends, you know, if they're interested, this is a wonderful opportunity just to get to know Catholic University and the architecture program. Um, the next one is actually in two weeks. And the topic of that one is going to be architecture and urbanism. But without further ado, let's just jump into tonight's session. So this is the first slide and we can go to the next one. So as I said, the theme of all of these sessions is what can you expect from an undergraduate architecture education at Catholic? Um, and then this one in specific, we're going to be talking about the experiences in architecture program. That's just how we're going to introduce and frame this one. And then um, at the end, you know, you can ask questions about anything, not just experiences in architecture. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Tanya, who is the director of the experiences in architecture program. Hi, everyone. Okay, so um, just to tell you a little bit about the program, we spend um, it depends on the summer, but generally it's three weeks. This year was a different scenario, but we spent three weeks in, in DC. We take advantage of the city as sort of a laboratory and we spend our mornings, um, you know, touring the city, visiting firms, uh, looking at having docent led tours in museums. And then we spend the afternoons sort of incorporating that work doing design projects um, and those de design projects sort of develop over the course of the three weeks. Um, we've had collaborations with USGBC. Um, we've had many, um, just many exciting visitors come and there's always, a, the evenings are packed with social activities, um, you know, soccer games or, you know, visiting, going to um, movies in the city. So it's a really, really fun, it's, it's super exhausting. It's also a really, fun experience. Uh, it's not like soccer camp. It's not like, it's just different. And it, it's a really uh, cool experience um, all around. This year we did it online. So I know that Annabelle could talk about how different that is. Maybe Annabelle will come back for the in-person one next year. Um, yeah, so that's our program. And we have, it, it's actually made amazing by the teachers and the students. So I'm just like a mirror player in this in this um, operation. The teachers have so much energy and um, get to know the students really well. And the students all come from such different backgrounds. So it's really fun. So. Thank you, Tanya. Um, so Catholic has a lot to offer and EIA gives you a small peek into that. Um, so what does that look like? Typically, we, when you sign up for EIA, we assume that you have no prior architectural learning. Um, so we start from the very beginning, all the way back to how you even hold a pencil when you're drawing. Um, as you can see at the first image on the right, uh, we even have a lesson dedicated to how you draw a line as an architect. Um, we also go over how to create tonal values with pen and pencils um, and all of these basics before we even look or talk about architectural drawings. Then we kind of go into what these uh, basic drawings are like. So we look at plans, elevations, sections, and perspectives. Um, other notions that will serve you throughout your architectural career that we also teach here in EIA include sketching, diagramming, model making, which you can see pictures of on the left. Um, and um, yeah, so in just two weeks, you get to expand your toolbox and learn notions that will put you uh, ahead of the game for your one-on-one -on -one class when you go into college and hopefully come to Catholic. Um, the process students make in just two weeks is really incredible. And we'll look at some um, examples of that in the next slide. So before we look at um, student work, I want to emphasize that one of the big advantages of coming to Catholic um, is that it's based in DC. So by extension, your classroom is, or DC becomes your classroom as well. Um, you get a preview of that you're in EIA, but you're really doing that when you're um, coming to Catholic. So the program is not entirely focused on learning technical tools but also on showing you what the experience being in DC will be like as an architecture student at Catholic University. Although this year we were limited by COVID, uh, we, did not, we did not let it stop us. So we um, did virtual tours of all of the uh, museums that you see there. So we 
virtually visited the Hirshen Museum, the National Building Museum, the MLK Library, and the Basilica. Um, and we brought the DC experience to the screens to all of the students. We were also very fortunate to be able to have virtual tour or virtual firm visits um, to some of the best firms in the DC area. Um, EI 2020 was the first time that we had a full week um, completely digital. So if you look at the first image under student works, you can see a project by one of our students from earlier this summer um, that completely drafted their project in SketchUp, which is one of the programs that you learn um, during your architectural career, but the students only had one week to learn and complete a project in that software. Um, if you look at the image right below it, you'll see a project that they entirely drafted by hand. Uh, and they presented a board of a concept that they completely designed from um, collages and sketching all the way to um, the final week. So EI is really just a short and very condensed version of what your time at Catholic will be like. Um, I'll now pass it on to Angus. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. Just to reiterate, I'm Angus Chase. Uh, I'm a second year IPAL student who attended the EIA program in the summer of 2018. Um, in addition to architecture, I play midfield on the men's lacrosse team here at Catholic. Um, as you can see, I have some of my favorite work posted on my slide and the vast majority of it's classically inclined. Uh, Tanya will know this, but prior to coming Catholic, I had very little respect for modern architecture and kind of regarded it as simple and boring. But after one of the EIA precedent projects, um, I learned how complex something so simple could be. And you know, you can see my folly project right there. Tanya watched me try and figure out how to do different views of that for about a, a, good, a good amount of time, a few hours. Um, and so I think that one thing that Catholic does a really great job of is educating its students, but not necessarily persuading them towards a certain direction in terms of classical or modern architecture. Rather, they allow you to make your own conclusions in that regard. And with that said, one of the main reasons that I chose to study architecture Catholic, as opposed to many other schools, was because of the IPAL program. And some of you might be wondering what IPAL stands for. A lot of people said it before, but IPAL is the Integrated Path to Architectural Licensure. And to put that short, it's a program that greatly accelerates the path to licensure for aspiring architects. And it might not sound terribly interesting, and I'm sure it sounds really boring to you guys to listen to it. But the reason I share it with you is because I was in your same shoes until I found out the average length of time it takes to become an architect and, excuse me, a licensed architect, which is approximately 10 to 12 years. And after hearing that, I was much more interested in compacting that amount of time as much as I could. Catholic is one of only 18 current programs with IPAL programs, which sets the school apart from many other. And after learning about the IPAL program, I decided I wanted to learn as much as I could about Catholic. So I joined the EIA program. And that leads me to my favorite thing about the School of Architecture at Catholic, which is the collaborativity of Crow, which is the architecture building school if you've never been. Um, when I came to EIA, I immediately felt integrated. There were IPAL summer classes who would come to meet with us and have pizza and critique our work so we could talk to them, not only about our work, but also the school and what it was like being a college student. Even since beginning as a freshman, I basically had a mentor from every year who I can call, even if it's two in the morning, um, when I need help with something. Last year, for an example, this is, I remember working on a project and having procrastinated as I normally do. Um, it was really late and it was late night after practice and I was trying to plot different views of a model I created in the 3D version of AutoCAD, which ironically I had chosen the most obscure part of AutoCAD that I guess is a like strictly Mac thing. It's just very odd and I couldn't figure it out by myself. So I remember sitting in the Crow Lab with a senior who's on the lacrosse team with me, um, Evan Markley, and then later on another senior, Colin Quinn. And they just sat there with me for hours, helping me figure it out. And I think that's very evident of an environment that is extremely conducive to the collaborative nature of architecture. And that's one of the reasons that I think everybody from Catholic produces such amazing work. So thank you again, everyone. And now you'll be hearing from Jack. Thank you, Angus. And as you guys may remember, uh, my name is Jack. I'm a third year architecture student at Catholic. And I'm a part of the 2019 IPAL cohort. Uh, Angus just explained it perfectly. Um, my time at CUA began in 2017 when I actually went to the EIA program uh, in person, unlike this summer. Uh, 
what looking back on EIA, it, I think it really embodied CUA's slogan, uh, the city is your campus. Like every day we'd start the morning off going on a field trip, just to sketch, have fun. Went from any, everywhere from the North National Portrait Gallery to all the Smithsonian's to the National Mall and whatnot. I thought that was a great time. After that, we would usually come back to campus and work in the studios. And you can see that in the first picture up top, uh, just an overhead of the studio work and the studio culture that we have and that we really got to experience the, like the first time. I thought that was great. Um, after class, it would usually end with us going to a sports game, uh, game night here on campus or like a movie night in Crow. That's the architecture school. You guys will see it eventually. Um, and just to talk a little bit about EIA, um, at the end of each week, we would present a project. So I have my three projects here. Project one at the end of the first week was an object redesign. And I'm sure Nikolai will tell you all about his project as well. My project was redesigning a pen to become a compass. And for those of you who don't know what a compass is, it, you can draw a perfect circle, uh, varying radius, radiuses. Uh, and uh, my pen, while it couldn't uh, adjust, drew a perfect three inch circle. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, project two was a case study. We studied some famous serpentine pavilions out in London. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our, uh, an architect is chosen every year to create a pavilion at the Serpentine Gallery. And my case study was on Toyo Ito's 2002 Serpentine Pavilion. And my last project was a reading folly for the campus of CUA. And that just goes uh, to show what we've learned from the beginning of week one to week three. Uh, learned all the drafting techniques, didn't have a drafting board, but we used tables and T-squares. That was fun. And now you will hear from Nikolai. Thank you very much, Jack. So again, my name is Nikola Dzinski. I'm also part of um, IPAL 2019, and I was also in EIA 2017, which was my first taste as well of Catholic University and architecture in general. Um, going into EIA 2017, I had no prior experience with architecture, and I was just mildly interested to see what it was like and um, how architecture school operated. And I think EIA, as we've discussed, um, lays it out perfectly and giving you that that just that little taste of what CUA offers and what you'll be doing and working with um, in the years to come in college. Um, so again, as we re as we have reiterated, um, every day was going into DC, going visiting sites, sketching, um, and just learning to analyze architecture, and then we come back and start implementing that into our own work with sketches, with just drawing, learning the basics. Um, and then we implemented those into our three projects as Jack kind of discussed. Um, our first project was object redesign in week one. Um, my project was taking an ordinary pen and repurposing it to be a multi-purpose pen that used multi uh, multiple different types of like ink or lead, um, basically an all around pen that could be used for drafting as well as whatever else you want. Um, kind of silly in my mind now that I look back at it, but I know I've come a long way from it since. Um, the second project was, again, our case study of Serpentine Pavilions in London. Uh, mine specifically was the Bjark Ingalls Group Serpentine Pavilion, or BIG for short. And we did this in groups of three, so there were other, two other students. Um, so these are just a few of the drawings from my work um, from this. I unfortunately don't have the drawings from the other students. Um, they were very nice, too. Um, and then finally, our Folly Reading Pavilion was our final project in week three, which was our first taste of just designing a small structure on our own without really guidance. Um, so that was a very fun project for me. Um, I got a little frustrated at times uh, when I had to re redesign it like two, two days before or the night before. Um, but it turned out pretty nice. Um, one of the reasons I particularly chose Catholic because of this was EIA definitely gave me that collaborative experience in just bouncing ideas off your classmates, your friends, um, seeing what they like, uh, what they think of your project, and just getting tips on how they're working, their work ethic compared to yours, and then you can give ideas and tips to them. Um, and that that really echoes into just how Crow and CUA architecture um, runs as a whole. It's just it's a great environment to work in, so I would highly recommend it. Um, 
And I'll pass it on to Alice and Devin. Thank you. Thanks, Nikolai. Running off right when he was talking about at the end, CUA is all about community, which I think you can really tell from what everyone said already tonight. Um, and this idea of community is only further emphasized than the architecture school itself. And we make every effort to bring this right in into EIA, even though it was an online program this summer, because we're all about collaboration at CUA, um, even with, within studio competitions when you're at school, we all wanna see everyone succeed. Um, so even in this virtual environment, we were able to really build a community. This picture on the bottom left is a picture of my studio group. And we got close because we sat in Zoom calls for like hours on end. Um, and then the photo on the right is one of the screens of like the two or three that we had going on with EIA this summer. Um, not gonna lie, we did have some people stay after the final call and cry and tell us how much it meant to them. So it was a great program for community itself because it's not just like learning about architecture, but it's learning about architecture with other people who care about architecture because it's hard when you're like, I know I go home and I like talk about like buildings and things I'm interested in. And my family's like, oh, okay. So like the weather today. And I'm like, no, I wanna talk about architecture with people who care about architecture. Um, and that's something that you find in the EIA program. Like it's a good starting point. Um, and it's something that you find in CU Arc itself. Um, we like to learn from each other in every level. Um, some of the other people have mentioned it already. I remember being a sophomore and having my grad student TA come to my desk saying, hey, can you, give, can you give me an opinion on something I'm designing? Because we're all working together. Everybody has valid ideas, no matter what age you are. Um, we're also gonna take a look at the online platform that we use this summer, um, which really already shows collaboration. The, all those little yellow, green, and blue comment like buttons, those were all people leaving comments on each other's work. Um, so every week it was people interacting with each other, both virtually on Zoom and virtually on this um, program. So this is all different images and stuff that people have created throughout. Just This is just from one of the three weeks. Um, and the boards were getting so heavy. We're like, we need to do a different one every week. Um, if you want to go to the next one, Robin, this is like zoom in on just one of the exercises. Um, beyond those comments, we also had sticky notes. Um, so anybody could leave a sticky note on anybody's work mm -hmm. and say like, oh, I really liked what you did here. Mm -hmm. But what even better was you could see everybody's work so you can learn from it because that's what we really like to do. Um, if someone has a really beautiful drawing, you're gonna wanna look at that drawing and be like, okay, I know it's beautiful, but why is it beautiful? And how can I implement that? Um, and it's something that we talk about throughout the week as well. And if you wanna look at the last one, Robin, this is just a screenshot of one of the exercises where students were tasked with drawing an object in their home. We challenged them to do a fruit, but if they didn't have a fruit or vegetable lying around, we even had trombone mouthpieces. So bringing in your other interests into architecture is really exciting as well. Um, that's what we have for you for the sum summarization of the summer EIA program and a little hint into uh, Catholic University and the School of Architecture and Planning. And we're really excited that you're all here and we're happy to take your questions now. I might like to, if I can, sneak in. I want to say one uh, one more thing about EIA as a as a kind of gateway into the school. I know you're all here because you're interested in CUA in general, um, uh, and you know every not every but many schools have this um, summer architecture program. I I uh, taught it for a couple of years at Harvard. I also ran it at Northeastern. Um, so a lot of schools have it, right? Um, but what's sort of special, not sort of, but incredibly special in my opinion about the way CUA, the EIA and the way it sort of gives a window into the actual school and the way we work at our school is that it, it really is, I think Allison said it very clearly at the end, it's all about collaboration. And I hope that um, Angus and Jack, and I mean, everyone touched on something about how, you know, it might've been your, the the paths forward or the IPAL, there are, are all these things, but the one thing that I think is truly exceptional about CUA is the collaborative atmosphere. And if you saw Allison's slide with her studio, um, you might have noticed that that studio was only six, six people, including Allison. And that's a pretty, that's a, a really small and very one-on-one uh, -on -one kind of 
um, experience. So I think that that's a, a very low ratio that you wouldn't find it elsewhere. So that's kind of a really special thing about CUA as well. Thank you, Tanya, very much. And thank you to all of those students um, for contributing. I appreciate you taking um, time out of your day. So if there are questions, we are available between everybody with a red background and Abby, we should be able to answer them all. So fire away or you can type it in the chat, whatever makes you most comfortable. Um, good afternoon. I have a question about juggling sports and architecture. Like how, how did you do that? Angus, that sounds like you. Um, so I think, you know, uh, first of all, being a normal architecture student, and then on top of that, being an IPAL student, IPAL is a lot. Uh, well, I, you know, I can't say too much about it right now because I kind of took a different path um, with us being online this summer, et cetera. But um, I haven't, I haven't noticed that. I think it's definitely a commitment that you have to decide whether you want to make or not. And I don't think it cuts down. I think it definitely cuts down on like things that you realize that aren't so important, but you start to realize you don't lose out on the things that like you make time for and you'll always like be able to figure out what you need to do and make time for the things that are important but it's it's not the end of the world i mean you'll you can make time for it, it it's a grind but you'll be all right so i have a lot of friends on different sports teams within the architecture program i have some on the swim team some on the soccer team especially and those students that play sports are some of the most hardworking students because they know if they have to get to practice, they need to get their work done either before or after. And they're often done before everybody else and they have high quality work because they're dedicated. So it's definitely possible. I think that's the best way to put it too. Like you realize that you have other things to do. So you don't just sit around doing nothing, you know, scratching your head for a while. I mean, you figure it out and you get, you get your work done when you need to get it done. So that's kind of the that's the deal for that, in my opinion. Thanks, Angus and Allison. Hi, um, how is the IPAL program functioning with uh, COVID and how is that all working out? Do any students want to answer this? I'm happy to do it as well. Okay, I'm going to jump in. Um, so I'm, I'm the director of the IPAL program. And basically, you know, we didn't know what to expect. You know, what are the firms going to do? Are they going to be able to find the internships? And what I will happily report is the students are finding internships. One of the benefits of being in the nation's capital, we are typically the last and lightest hit by any economic downturn. I've been practicing in this area over 20 years, and we've had a couple of economic downturns, and I've been able to find work uh, with no problem. So therefore, each semester, we have between 10 and 20 students that are looking for internships. And I'm kind of the person in charge of helping them and providing any support required. A lot of students find the internships on their own or they already have networking um, options, but if they don't, I'm there for them. And so when we started this semester, I think about uh, 10 students still needed internships and I have to place three more. So we're finding the internships and, and we actually have a couple more months because they don't start until January. So I, I would never say that we can predict the future, especially if 2020 has taught me anything, but I will say I am very pleasantly surprised with the networking of the professors in the school, our network with the professionals in this area, um, and the amazing IPAL students that we have. And kind of add on to Robin, if I may, is before I kind of mentioned I had a weird track with IPAL um, and I'm very short into it so far, but I decided I was supposed to go to online classes this summer and I decided that wasn't something that I wanted to do, that I'd rather work and get experience um, doing something in that in that manner. And, you know, in terms of just class scheduling and figuring everything out with that, um, both Robin and Patricia sat down with me. Um, this is before Patricia went on leave um sat down with me for hours and rearranged my entire tracking sheet for the next six years five and a half years or whatever it is um all my classes so that i would be set up to do what i wanted to do and even the previous dean um, who still teaches here but he he got on the call and said like you know he guided he guided me and asked me is this what you want to do and i explained to him what i wanted to do and i had full support from everybody and i think that was something that was really special that you don't get a lot of programs so I'm going to jump right off of that again. Um, what Angus just mentioned is something that's really cool about Catholic is that our professors are really dedicated to us. 
um, in every discipline, but especially in architecture, I found that they really want us to succeed and they'll go above and beyond to help us in every way. So whether it's fixing your tracking sheet, I know Robin was doing that right at the beginning of this phone call for my tracking sheet. Um, they're they're going to help you out and give you connections and help you succeed. Okay, we got a question in the chat. I can read it out loud if someone wants to answer it. I missed the first 20 minutes because of internet issues. Um, so they don't know if it was covered, but how difficult would you say the mathematics courses are for the architecture program? Would they be around the intensity level of an engineering course? Nikolai, I think it'd be good if you answered this since your brother is a dual degree. I can't speak to all the difficulties, especially since my brother, he's a dual major in civil engineering and architecture, which is one of the hardest things you can take at Catholic University. I myself am just a straight architecture or architect student in ITAL. Um, but I was surprised because I only had to take one credit of mathematics going in um, to CUA, and that was just my first year. So it actually was not a lot of math, and it was just your typical calc and whatever you placed honors or whatnot. Um, and, I, and again, if you take the dual degree engineering, then you're going to do a lot more mathematics just because it's engineering. But architecture itself does not require a lot of mathematics. Just be able to use a ruler. <laughs> Abby, do you want to talk at all about uh, math placement exams or anything like that? Yeah, so I know generally in the admissions office when we're looking for students looking to do architecture, it, it does look better um, on your application to at least have four full years of math and getting to kind of a, a typical fourth year of math. For most high school students would be pre-calc, calculus, stats, something like that. Um, with math placement, um, you can use an AP exam. So if you take um, an AP math class in high school and you take the exam, fours and fives um, for most subjects will typically get you credit. And a lot of times you can use those for some of these kind of entry level courses into the programs um, at Catholic or use them towards um, credits for minors or a double major or, you know, things like that. Um, I believe we're also, they're also utilizing, they might be utilizing SAT, um, the SAT subject exams, but overall for admissions to Catholic, we are test blind. Um, so we are not reviewing SAT or ACT scores this year. Um, there was just so many testing disruptions with COVID for the past five or so years, we've been test optional anyways. Um, so test scores, weren't even playing a huge role in the admissions process to begin with. And that was the last thing we wanted you to stress over in the application process because they just weren't, they were not playing a big role. So um, we are test blind this year for SAT and ACT, but definitely if you have the ability to take the AP exams, um, I, would, I would definitely consider doing that, especially if it's a class you're doing well in because that can really um, benefit you in earning credit here at Catholic, or even if you're doing some dual enrollment classes as well, same thing. Abby, can you answer the other question in the chat about CTE courses? Um, CTE, uh, sorry, could someone remind me what CTE, is that, I'm, I'm sorry, could you let me know? I don't know what that is <laughs> either. Uh, Carly, do you, I'm not familiar with the acronym. It's, I probably know what they are. I just, I don't know what the, the acronym is. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's um, career technology and education. It's a public school thing. So I applied to it. I don't go to my zone public school. Okay. But um, there's specific drafting courses. Okay. Um, so we would probably, so those kind of, it sounds very similar um, to Project Lead the Way, um, in which case we would definitely include those in the review process. Um, like when we're, when we're looking at your application, um, primarily we're looking at kind of the core subjects, science, math, foreign language, um, history, English, things like that. But um, for many schools that have um, similar kind of like engineering architecture programs, we will um, include those in the review. I, I'm not 100% sure about obtaining credit through them. Um, that would be something to talk about, talk with um, our transfer credit coordinator. Um, our, our Office of Admissions itself doesn't um, review classes for the transfer of credit. Um, so that would, our transfer credit coordinator could probably better explain that. 
but we could definitely include them in the review process. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Abby. We have one other question. I think I might handle that. Um, what is the difference between a Bachelor of Art in Architecture Studies major and a Bachelor of Science in Architecture major? Uh, so basically, what it involves is a Bachelor of Science in Architecture is what we call a pre-professional degree. It's the first degree that you need, as we have discussed tonight, on your path to becoming a licensed architect. So that's a four-year program. After that uh, degree, you would take a master's of architecture, which is a two-year program. So those two degrees combined with working in a firm and taking the architecture registration exams are the three components that you need to be a registered architect. If you take a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture, and our actual course is called, or the degree is called a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture Studies, uh, that is basically fewer architecture studios and more um, areas of interest is what we call it. So if you have lots of different interests and you wanna get a foundational understanding of architecture, that would be the degree for you. Um, you have the opportunity to just look into all of your personal interests. Um, 120 credits for that degree versus 126 for the Bachelor of Science in Architecture Studies. So relatively the same, both are four year degrees. But the main difference I would say is the Bachelor of Art degree is not a pre-professional degree. So if you wanted a pre-professional degree, that would be the Bachelor of Science in Architecture. Let me know if that did not answer. I wanna add on to that because sure. I think Robin and I are really good examples of two paths to the same place. Um, licensure is, is an important part of uh, practice. And uh, you know, like she said, there's the exam, there's the education and there's the practice. So you need to have these three things in order to get licensed. Um, and so in order to take the exam, you need to have gone to a school that is accredited, which our school is, um, and you need a professional degree. So whether you get a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Arts, neither of those will give you the ability to sit for an exam. You need to have go to the master's program. And that's the case for any of these bachelor, unless you do a Bachelor of Architecture, which there's like maybe one or two schools in the country left that do that because nobody really does that anymore. So, um, but so you, you can choose um, either of these paths for the undergraduate degree are fantastic. And either of them will help you um, round out your overall education and help you into a master's program in architecture should you choose. Um, if you have a bachelor of arts, you will then probably have to get, take a few more classes, probably about a year's worth of classes because you're taking other things um, in, towards a master's. Both of them are the same, you know, like you end up, you're going to end up with a master in architecture in order to get licensed. Um, I did a Bachelor of Arts in architecture and Robin probably did a Bachelor of Science. I did a Bachelor of Architecture. She did a Bachelor of Architecture, <laughs> the short, even shorter, the five year. Um, so uh, there's different ways to get there. But um, what I'll say on top of that, Tanya, is I did the Bachelor of Science in Architecture and now I'm getting my Master of Architecture. But because I did undergrad at CUA and um, I was advanced in my classes, I got advanced standing. So I'm getting a master of architecture in five and a half years, where if you went to a bachelor of architecture program, you're just getting a bachelor's degree in five years. So I'm adding literally an extra half a semester because I'm, I'm like ahead of my classes. So I, I have half a semester extra to get a master's degree. And I mean, I, I'm not out in the professional world fully. I've done internships, but I feel like that lives, leaves me in pretty good standing when applying to jobs, getting a master versus a bachelor degree. More information than you ever wanted to know about the degrees. And I'll throw one more piece of information on if I might. I'm trying to get Allison to stick around Catholic because it's the coolest place ever for one more semester. Um, to get what we call a master's of science in net zero design. Right now, Catholic University is the only school in the country that offers this degree. And it's all about super sustainable design. How do we not, uh, not only not make the world um, bad, <laughs> but how do we regenerate it? How do we design our buildings so it actually regenerates the earth and the people that are in the buildings? So this is a new degree offering. I'm trying to get Allison uh, to sign up and take it. Um, and that's why she's working on my tracking sheet. <laughs> yes. 
Um, so if you're interested in sustainable design, there's another combination where you can actually graduate with two master's degrees from Catholic University. And I know that is a, a lot of information and it's years away for you guys. I just want you to know that if you come to Catholic, we've got you covered in both the professional realm and the sustainability world. One thing to really be mindful as you're looking at schools is to make sure that you are look if you're interested in architecture is that it's a school that's accredited. If you attend a school that isn't accredited, the education doesn't actually count <laughs> when you're going towards the, that three part uh, completion towards licensure. If you're at a school that isn't accredited, um, it's great that you got that education, but it means the licensing board hasn't um, hasn't seen it the same way. So you need to make sure that you are, um, you find a, if it, that that's the kind of school you want. And that's why IPAL is actually a really awesome program because you you not only are part of an accredited program, but a, an accredited accelerated program by the licensing uh, board. So it's, a, it's really neat actually. These are also, questions. if you're not sure that you wanna be an architect, you don't need to feel pressure to go into the IPAL program either. Um, I was in the first class that was allowed to do it and I decided not to after being accepted um, because you can achieve your hours on your own. Um, the only difference is you have to wait to take your exams until after you graduate and that's what takes longer. Um, as long as you're getting internships on your own and making that effort, then you can still get um, your license eventually as well. I actually already have 2100 hours out of my 3700 that are required to become a licensed architect. I think one of the themes I'm seeing here is there's lots of different paths. Catholic University is fluent in all of them. So come to Catholic. Yay. Now, none of you have seen the building. Have they seen a video of the building or do they see? Because I think also our building is something that's really, it's just, it's my, it's the people and the building. You go in there and it's like so nice and relaxed. Have they seen a video? I can drop the YouTube link in the chat, it's which so is nice. the virtual tour, which doesn't, doesn't do Allison it justice. It? Yeah, Allison is our host. It Yay. doesn't do it justice because it's not filled with students because of coronavirus, but it'll give you an idea of what it might be like when you have 300 students in it at two and, in the morning. <laughs> and the school website has a aerial footage of the studio spaces in action um, from like a year or two ago that they captured. And it's like live on the website if you just look up the Catholic University architecture program. And I think Sophia was raising her hand, right? You have a question? Um, is it possible to do the IPO program and study abroad? Tanya, shall you answer this one? Yeah. There is awesome. definitely study abroad options. So study abroad um, in CUA has had like a robust, a very robust study abroad program. And as you can imagine, the Catholic University of America has a specific relationship with Rome. Uh, we have a building there uh, that's a really beautiful building that we have architecture studios in. Students can go for an entire semester. We are also now uh, growing a which some of you students don't know so much yet, but we're growing a summer program because now we have the building all the time. Um, and there'll be a series of courses that we offer over the course of the summer. Um, of course, this last year we weren't able to um, offer, pro well, we had to bring students back last spring, but we are sending students out again in the summer um, and we hope to grow that program as well. We have relationships with, um, schools, we actually are starting a relationship with the University of Cairo. There's also a lot of um, interesting programming happening in South America. Uh, there's lots of international opportunities and with the architecture department specifically, um, while it's been on hold, so most of these students haven't seen as much movement, um, international movement in the last year, um, we'll have uh, discrete studios where you can go, we had a studio in Japan, there's, you know, there's, there can be a lot of opportunities um, in, during the summers and during the school year. You can also choose to participate in a program that's offered by the university that isn't specifically the architecture department, right? So there's plenty of those opportunities. Um, when I was an undergrad, I did a study abroad with another university and those credits can also transfer. Um, so um, that's something you can look into those kinds of opportunities as well. CUA is really flexible. You know, I'm talking a lot. 
when I went to Rome and it was life-changing and you should definitely study abroad if you have a chance. And I know that's super cliche, like, oh, I studied abroad and it changed my life, but it really does, especially as an architecture major. Yes. Uh, yeah. Especially so in Rome. I cried in a lot of buildings. It just happens. <laughs> I mean, when we talk about the uh, EIA, the summer experience, you know, about, you know, really taking advantage of DC, I think as you start to learn the tools and the way to see spaces around you, you get really excited and travel is a really huge part of that, really seeing the world and starting to understand how buildings impact you and people and the way we operate with each other. It's really, it's really important. So I think we see it as an important uh, part of your education, so. Parents beware. I guess all the parents are gone now. Your kids will travel. I have another question. Um, what states like nearby accept your IPAL program licensure? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, like, I know you would be licensed in DC, but does that license, is that also valid in other jurisdictions like in Maryland or Virginia? Sure, that's a great question. I think I'll jump in and if anyone else wants to add, they can actually, Tanya, do you wanna take it since you're, you might be Well, best. I mean, uh, I'm sure Robin is really, would be able to answer this too, but my understand, wherever you decide to take the tests um, and you have the choice, my understanding is you can choose, let's say you are from South Dakota, like myself, and I wanted to go back home and take all the tests with my parents around or something, um, or to have my mom prepare breakfast before the exams, those 7 a.m. exams, um, I might uh, I might choose to do that. Or maybe there's a loophole in South Dakota. They have like one less test, which they don't, but whatever. Um, or maybe there's better rest. Or maybe I'm from California, and I want to make sure I get licensed in California because of the special seismic um, additional testing there. But I... Um, where you test is where it will be where you end up with the license, which will then um, be part of the reciprocity uh, of where to where you go afterwards. So I think you choose where you start, wherever you start is up to you. And so just an example for myself, I took my exams in Virginia. So I became a licensed architect in Virginia, but then in my firm, I wanted to work in Maryland because I do schools and libraries and I've done so many in Maryland. Um, so what that involved is I'm a member of NCARB so I basically paid them a fee and then I became a licensed architect in Maryland because I had already done everything you needed to do and Maryland and Virginia have reciprocity. So that means you can go back and forth. There are some states that you would have to do a fee and something else. So that I would just encourage you to look at the NCARB website. It's ncarb.org. And you can just type in which state and a, a map comes up and you can kind of just see what you have to do for each state. Fun Any fact, you can actually start earning hours in high school um, once you have, like not in high school, once you have um, a high school degree, you can start um, interning and gaining hours. I started that after my senior year. Allison is on top of things. Yeah. <laughs> my dad is very type A. So before I could even apply to architecture school, I needed to know everything and anything about being an architect. So now I do. <laughs> there you go. Good question. James, I see a question, a hand. Sorry, I have a lot of questions, but no, I'm that's what we're here for. Questions in Zoom classes. So <laughs> how well does the architecture program at CUA transfer to church architecture? Students. Oh my gosh, I'm oh. so excited. <laughs> okay. okay, so two answers. <laughs> I'm talking a lot. I'm so sorry. Two answers. Um, we actually have some pretty famous um, church architect designers. Like if you're interested in classical church architecture, um, James McCreary is the head of the classical department within the architecture school, and he has his own firm and designs churches. Um, but the second thing that I was going to say is I, on a whim, said to one of our um, associate deans who is on maternity leave that I was like oh I think it'd be great if Crow had a chapel because sometimes it's 3 a.m and you need a little bit of Jesus and she said we're gonna make it a class and last spring Rebecca and I were in this class together 
where we got to design theoretical chapels, both for um, a residential hall on campus and for um, Crow, like the architecture building. And it was a really cool experience. And we're definitely interested in church architecture at CUA. And I would actually piggyback off of that, Allison. Uh, the professor that ran that cl classes, his name is Julio Bermudez, and he leads our sacred and cultural concentration for the master's program. So everything that is considered sacred and cultural, uh, he does. And he's pretty world renowned as well. He's doing a lot of research right now. Um, he did a TV show with Morgan Freeman. It's pretty fun. Um, so we, we kind of approach it from all different angles. A lot of us are practicing architects. A lot of us are uh, more theoretical based. So you kind of have so many different options at Catholic. Um, so that was a great question, James. Thank you so much. I dropped a link to an article about Julio and Morgan Freeman. Oh yeah, great. It was a great show. Um, Sam, question. Um, I would love to ask the same question, but in regards to residential architecture. Who, which student wants to take that? What do we think? Well, I can say something. I'm not a student. You said student. <laughs> Sorry, okay, you student go. first. <laughs> well, I also say we have a new dean who has the um, largest uh, residential residential only firm in the states and. Uh, I think that's pretty amazing actually to have a practicing architect who's doing so much um, as the head of the school. I think that will percolate into everything we do, including, you know, thinking of, of this earth as our home. Uh, but I, I, you know, there's also residential architecture that's happening in your third year studio. You'll do um, a residential project, not a single family home, you know, in the Hamptons, but like a real urban urban condition. So there's, um, does that answer your question, Sam? Sort of, yeah. And I would just add, um, what I did in school is I interned with a residential architect for two summers to get a sense of that. And I was absolutely sure that's what I wanted to do. And then I graduated and I took a job at a, a firm that was gonna set me up for my exam so I could learn how to size steel. And that's where I found my love of civic architecture. And then 20 years later, here I am. So again, it's an interesting path. You know, I love residential as well for many different reasons. Um, and I always say that if I wasn't doing civic architecture, I would definitely be doing residential. So then you have a lot of professors like me. So I have a background in it, um, but I just chose a different path. So a lot of us are, are multi-talented and can speak to a lot of different things. Also, when you work in a firm, some small firms will, like that's your bread and butter or the place you start. So sometimes in smaller firms, You'll, you'll do that if you're in a larger firm, you know, so depending on your experience and, or what kind of experience you go for in your internships, you'll see, you'll see different kinds of projects. And what's cool is that we don't just do housing, like there are also studios that do housing that address social issues. Like there was a studio last fall that did um, mega structures. So it was this idea that uh, the coastline, the coastal lines are are pulling back because of water levels rising. So if in 50, 60 years, Newark, New Jersey is underwater, how are we gonna house people? And it was basically designing like a city on stilts. Like how do you get them up above the water? Um, I just commented that I did micro unit modular housing. So that's the idea that um, it's like individual units placed into a building, um, but we were allowed to choose our, our site. So I did a site in Virginia but someone else did a site in the Middle East and they chose a city that has suffered from bombings and providing housing for them as they try to re-urbanize the area. So we're addressing like current and ongoing issues in society as well in our design choices. Any other questions? We have about three more minutes. I'm totally open to stick around. Uh, if you want to ask the questions on a more one-on-one -on -one, uh, platform, we're happy to do that. But if anyone has any questions in the final minutes, we are open. Maybe we answered them all and that is fine. Um, so what I will do now is I will stop recording. <laughs>